Greetings in the name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. I am so glad that you can join us this morning. As we are entering into this time of worship and as we are celebrating the fifth Sunday of Easter and celebrating the hope that we have in Christ Jesus, I want to remind you that it is that hope that binds us and unites us together as Christians. So even though we aren't together here, we are still united through this hope that we have in Christ Jesus. And so I would like to invite you to send a text message, make a phone call, write a letter to someone this week, one of your brothers and sisters in Christ, and express to them the joy that you have in them and the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. Now, let's join together and worship our living hope, Jesus Christ. Very 
invite you to hear the word of the Lord from John chapter 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house there are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father, and I will do whatever you ask in my name, that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. This is the word of God for the people of God this morning. Let us give thanks. Thanks be to God. Don't. 
scripture reading from 1 Peter chapter 2. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And this is good news for us this morning. Let us give thanks. Say 
shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the Lord, faultless to As we continue to worship, let's enter into a time of prayer together, lifting before our gracious God our words of petition and praise. And as we do so, if you would like to kneel where you're at or stand and lift your hands in prayer, I would invite you to take the posture that facilitates your praying with us as we pray together. Would you join me? Gracious and loving God, we're so thankful today that we have Christ as our cornerstone, that our lives and our hope are built solidly on him, and that we are being fashioned into this people, this living building of those who sing and declare the praises of God who called us out of darkness and into his light. We celebrate your mercy today. We celebrate your grace and your goodness. We celebrate, gracious God, the ways that you are shaping your life in us. We celebrate the salvation that is ours in Jesus Christ. And as we pray this morning, we give you praise. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. And as we continue to pray, gracious God, we thank you not only for the goodness and grace that has been shown to us in Jesus Christ, but we thank you for the ways that your abundance and blessing has manifested itself in our lives over and over and over again. We thank you for your daily provision. We thank you for uh, the ways that you have given us the goodness of creation. We thank you, gracious God, for the food we eat and the air we breathe and the love that we share with one another and with family and friends. And on this Mother's Day, we especially thank you, Lord, for the gift of moms. We thank you for the gifts of moms who have loved us and nurtured us and walked with us and encouraged us and blessed us and pointed us to Jesus. Some of them are biological moms and grand, grandmothers, but others are uh, spiritual moms and grandmothers. Folks, you've given us in our journey together as the body of Christ, who have made a tremendous impact on our lives. And for all of these moms, our biological and our spiritual, we give you thanks. Please keep all mothers safe from this virus and bless them with patience and forgiveness. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Bless all pregnant mothers with healthy babies and keep them safe. Lord, you said the number of our days you would fulfill. Give our mothers long life and good health as a reward for how they've taken care of us and others through their lifetime. Lord, bless our moms with abundant love, abundant grace, and abundant coffee. Will you fill our mothers with the wisdom, confidence, and strength to live out and pass on the security of truly knowing you? Uh, blessed Lord to be able to celebrate today uh, the tremendous women that you have placed in our lives uh, who have uh, filled our lives with your goodness and pointed us to the love of Christ. But even as we pray Lord with the great spirit of thanksgiving on this Mother's Day we also um, just are very much aware that Mother's Day is this mixed bag kind of holiday. It's a day where we celebrate 
uh, the blessing of moms, but it's also a day where we are acutely aware of some of the painful realities uh, of life, where moms failed, where they didn't do so good a job of loving and caring, where um, uh, there's hurt, where there's pain, where there's a sense of injustice or abuse. Um, we pray, gracious God, for your ministry to those who feel that pain. Um, we pray, Lord, uh, for moms who are in the wanting, but not yet able to have children and feel the hurt and the pain that this day represents. Uh, for them, we pray for your comfort and grace. We pray for those who are uh, missing moms because their physical presence isn't uh, here any longer, um, and they are missing greatly that significant person in their lives and grieving today to some extent. Um, we pray for your grace and comfort. We're very much aware, Lord, that Mother's Day is a day of rejoicing and thanksgiving and joy, but it's also for many a day in which there is a sting um, of hurt whether it's rejoicing or pain, uh, we ask, Lord, that you will fill this day with your presence and that you will bless and minister to our lives. Especially, Lord, bless our moms. Bless the ladies of this church family. Be their joy, be their strength, be their hope, be their peace. And we would pray that not only for them, but for all of us, Lord, in the variety of circumstances we find ourselves, in the varying uh, situations that we face, in, in uh, light of uh, the uh, people that we're praying with and for, uh, we would ask, Lord, that you would bless us all with your joy, your love, your grace, your hope, your peace. Be our healer, be our help, be our deliverer, be our salvation. Our Hope is in you, Lord. Our refuge is in you. You are our cornerstone in your Son, Jesus Christ. And we trust all things into your hands today in Jesus' name. Continue to bless us as we worship, um, as we listen to your word, as we sing the songs of the people of God, as we declare our faith in all that we do in the remainder of this time that we share together. Bless us with your presence. Help us to hear your voice. Awaken our ears. Open our eyes. Soften our hearts that we might be a responsive people to the things that you have for us in this time of worship. And bless us, Lord, and grow us and shape us and continue to build us into this spiritual house uh, that would declare your praise and empower us, Lord to go from this place as your people, built on the cornerstone of Jesus Christ, blessing and ministering to our world in Jesus' name. For we ask all of these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, I invite everyone to join me in praying the prayer our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Hear the word of the Lord from Psalm 31. In you, O Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness. Turn your ear to me. Come quickly to my rescue. Be my rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me. Since you are my rock and my fortress, for the sake of your name, lead and guide me. Free me from the trap that is set for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Redeem me, O Lord, the God of truth. I hate those who cling to worthless idols. 
I trust in the Lord. I will be glad and rejoice in your love, for you saw my affliction and knew the anguish of my soul. You have not handed me over to the enemy, but have set my feet in a spacious place. Be merciful to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eyes grow weak with sorrow, my soul and my body with grief. My life is consumed by anguish, and my years by groaning. My strength fails because of my affliction, and my bones grow weak. Because of all my enemies, I am the utter contempt of my neighbors. I am a dread to my friends. Those who see me on the street flee from me. I am forgotten by them as though I were dead. I have become like broken pottery, for I hear the slander of many. There is terror on every side. They conspire against me and plot to take my life. But I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hands. Deliver me from my enemies and from those who pursue me. Let your face shine on your servant. Save me in your unfailing love. Let me not be put to shame, O Lord, for I have cried out to you. But let the wicked be put to shame and lie silent in the grave. Let their lying lips be silenced, for with pride and contempt they speak arrogantly against the righteous. How great is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you, which you bestow in the sight of men on those who take refuge in you. In the shelter of your presence, you hide them from the intrigues of men. In your dwelling, you keep them safe from a speaking tongue. Praise be to the Lord, for he showed his wonderful love to me when I was in a besieged city. In my alarm, I said, I am cut off from your sight. Yet you heard my cry for mercy when I called to you for help. Love the Lord, all his saints. The Lord preserves the faithful, but the proud he pays back in full. Be strong and take part, all you who hope in the Lord. This is our song of hope this morning. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let us give thanks. Thanks be to God for his word. Some people say they dislike change. Or to be more accurate, they say they hate change. Change can be scary and disruptive. There is a security in what is known and customary. Rather than embrace change, people often choose to resist it. I identify with folks who dislike change, but it's not because I dislike change. Even though I have let those words, I hate change, escape the gateway of my lips, the truth is I believe in change. I believe change is foundational to growth and foundational to progress. As one who uh, wrote or typed on an old-fashioned typewriter papers in both high school and college, I'm regularly thankful for word processing programs. I don't miss the days of multiple drafts and of using whiteout, either the liquid variety or the uh, tape variety, or constantly having to reach up on the bookshelf to pull down the dictionary and thesaurus and thumb through them to find the correct spelling or the right word. I like the progress. I'm thankful for the change. I'm also glad that at 51 years of age, I'm still not sporting training pants or telling myself I can and should be all things for all people in order to keep everyone happy. I have changed. I've grown personally and I continue to do so. And I continue to learn things about myself and about life and about God and about people. And the 2020 version of me is a maturing addition. And I'm thankful for the transformations that have led to that maturity. I'm thankful for change. And then there's the fact that I'm a minister of a gospel which is all about change. And it doesn't take very long reading in the scriptures to be reminded of that reality. 
Behold, I am making all things new, God says in the book of Revelation. Or Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. Or uh, in Colossians, Paul writes, put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. And again, in Revelation, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. Christianity, newness, change, they go hand in hand. Which is why I say I believe in change. Change is necessary. It's important. I am a fan of change. Change is not really what I dislike. What I hate is the uncertainty that regularly accompanies change. You see, change makes no promises. It holds no guarantees. Success or failure may follow. We may step forward only to find ourselves sliding two steps back. The pain and cost may be more than we bargained. There is with every newness variation and risk. There's uncertainty. I'm all about change. It's the uncertainty I hate. Which is why I didn't like the first day of school. Did I want to learn and grow? Yes, very much so. Did I hate the uncertainty of uh, the new teacher's expectations or uh, of whether or not I would fit in with this new set of classmates or the potential for embarrassment if I didn't know how to negotiate the routines of a new grade or a new school? Even more so. It's also why I never share my children's excitement about getting a new smartphone? Do I love the thought of more technology, information, and capability in the palm of my hand than was available to NASA when they were launching space flights the year I was born? I love that thought, absolutely. Do I hate the uncertainty of what apps I should put on my phone, what are safe to download, do I hate the uncertainty of the uh, question marks about permissions that are safe to give to certain apps on my phone? Do I hate the likelihood, uh, the uncertainty and the likelihood that at some point I'm going to look and feel old, out of date and out of touch because I cannot figure out how to do something on my phone? Absolutely. I hate it. You see, I'm not sure any of us really hate change. I simply think we've all learned enough about the uncertainty that attends change to be wary of change whenever we encounter it. And if we've been scarred by that uncertainty deep enough, we have learned to resist or avoid change altogether. It's the uncertainty that is our shared enemy. The uncertainty is why I can identify with people who hate change. Would that be true for you as well? What is true of our experience with all change is especially true of our experience with changes we perceive as negative or threatening. It's especially true of changes we don't want. It's especially true of the kinds of changes that crisis brings our way. We don't want our economy to crumble. That's a threatening change. We don't want society or our world to fall into this gun-blazing anarchy. That's a threatening change. We don't want a doctor to tell us of this potentially deadly disease that has taken up residence in our body. That's a threatening change. We don't want to hear that a disability is permanent. That's a threatening change. We don't want to discover that we've been mocked behind our backs or betrayed by someone we trusted. That's a threatening change. We don't want to find ourselves stuck in a relationship or in an activity that harms us or harms those around us. That is a threatening change. And the potential for those kinds of threatening change, they're all around us. The potential is all around us. No wonder so many of us live anxious. 
We live anxious. And even when we're joyful, even when times are good, we live with this foreboding sense that at any moment, the shoe of fate is going to drop. And we will find ourselves facing the threat of tragedy and the uncertainty it brings to our lives. Every moment of every day of every year brings newness and variation and risk and potential threats our way. What do we do with all that uncertainty? Do we rush around and try to secure the future? Do we work hard at the game of survival, trying to create a safe future and control all our outcomes? Do we fight to survive? Or do we draw away, keep a low profile, and try to get by? Do we try to avoid and isolate ourselves from threats so that we can stay safe in the uncertainty of the future? Do we run away in order to live another day? Do we practice fight or flight? And if those are our only survival options in the face of this overwhelming uncertainty that fills our lives, fight or flight, how in the world do we follow Jesus, who says to us that we must lose our lives to really find life? Fight? Flight, or is there another way to deal with uncertainty? And if there is another way, would we be interested in knowing about it? If there's another way besides our determined or despairing patterns of dealing with uncertainty, either fight or flight, would we want to hear about it? Or better yet, would we want to see someone live it. The religious leadership sets the trap for Jesus. Judas, the betrayer, springs it with these lying lips that kiss Jesus' cheek. Rough hands seize Jesus, and he becomes the prisoner of human intrigues. Before the Sanhedrin, it becomes clear that, that there are enemies who seek to take his life. Like a city under siege, false witnesses catapult accusations at him. Angry voices speak against any who seek to hear Jesus for himself. There is an agenda fraught with contemptuous questions designed to trap or mislead or condemn. It's a mockery of a trial. Pilate is brought into the picture. He is necessary for a death verdict. Crucify, they scream, abandoned and forgotten by the crowds who had welcomed him earlier in the week. Pilate joins the club and washes his hands of Jesus. Soldiers then break his body. They stripe his back with a whip. With a crown of thorns and a purple robe, they mock him. With hardened fists and devastating slaps, they beat him. They strip him of his clothing and march him through the streets of Jerusalem to humiliate him. Soldiers then nail through his feet and hands and lift him up to die on a cross. The distress of Jesus' affliction doesn't lessen as he struggles on that cross between life and death. Wicked voices are determined to add to his grief and add to his sorrow. He saved others, they yell. Let him save himself if he's God's Messiah, the chosen one. Even another sufferer, another sufferer of Jesus' fate, manages to gather enough breath as he hangs on his own cross to speak against Jesus. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. Jesus is cut off. A forlorn figure on a desolate hill undergoing tremendous affliction. There are many hopeless scenes that could be numbered with Jesus in the annuals of human history. None, however, surpasses it. Death is inevitable. The end is certain. The future is non-existent. 
And then Jesus calls him in a loud voice. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He quotes Psalm 31 from the cross. And when he does, he shows us another way to face the threat of uncertainty. The psalmist in Psalm 31 knows the threat of uncertainty. Threat words are everywhere in this psalm. Trap, affliction, anguish, enemy, wicked, distress, weak, sorrow, grief, groaning, contempt, dread, forgotten, dead, lying lips, uh, broken, conspire, pursue, take life, speak against, intrigues, accusing, alarm, cut off, under siege, everywhere. In this psalm are threat words and all the weight of uncertainty that they carry. The psalm, however, doesn't focus on threat with its uncertainty. From the very first words, the psalm focuses on God. In you, Lord. In you, Lord. In you. Psalm focuses on God. In you, Lord, I take refuge. It's the person of God that's the focus of the psalm. God is righteous, abundant in goodness. God is faithful, true to those who are true to God. God is merciful. God's love is unfailing. God is capable and strong, a sure rock of refuge, a strong fortress of salvation, a wonder-working deliverer. This is the certain character of God. It's the character of God confirmed when God broke Hebrew, uh, broke the Pharaoh's hold on the Hebrews in their slavery and led them through Red Sea waters as their deliverer. It's the certain character of God made known when God provided for the Hebrews for 40 years in the desert. 40 years in the desert giving them manna from heaven and water from rocks, keeping their clothing from wearing out and their feet from swelling as they walk those burning sands. It's the sure character of God revealed when God brought those same Hebrew slaves into the land of promise and gave them an abundance they could not and did not create for themselves. It's the certain, sure, character of God expressed when God gave to those same Hebrew slaves, leaders like Moses and Joshua, Samuel and David, to shepherd them and lead them in right paths. Faced with threat and all of its attending uncertainty, the psalm turns in certainty to the certain character of the person of God. Jesus does the same when he quotes the psalm from the cross. He reaffirms the trust he had in the Garden of Gethsemane when he prayed, not my will, but your will. He reaffirms the trust that he had before the trap was sprung and the tragedy uh, set in motion and his fate sealed. He reaffirms the trust he had when he could foresee what was coming in all of its uncertainty and all of its threatening ugliness and groaned in prayerful anticipation. Jesus' words on the cross aren't words of resignation spoken by one hopelessly given over to his fate. They are words spoken by the one who could have done fight and flight. Spoken by the one who could have called 10,000 angels to put an end to all of this madness, to this threat of uncertainty, but instead modeled another way, the way of hope. In the face of impossibility, peering into the blackness of uncertainty with all odds and indications against believing, Jesus in hope entrusted himself in the sure hands of God. In the garden, not my will, but thy will, your will, and on the cross. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Jesus in hope trusted himself into the sure hands 
of God into the righteous, capable, faithful, good, merciful, sure kingdom of his certain deliverer. Jesus prays a prayer of hope and sings a song of hope in the crux of the crisis while hanging on the cross. In doing so, he invites us into a different way than either our determined or despairing hopelessness, than either our fight or our flight, than the death spiral of survival. He invites us into a path of hope, and he invites us to sing him a song of hope. When the COVID-19 pandemic began and uncertainty clouded every horizon, social media exploded with people singing, He's got the whole world in his hands. 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 The affirmation in the song is that God has got all of us, you and me, brother and sister, little bitty baby, and the aged and the vulnerable, in God's righteous, good, capable, strong, loving, merciful, faithful, unfailing hands. That our lives, our times and seasons are in God's hands. The old spiritual is meant to be a song of hope, celebrating the certainty of God. But brother and sister, it only becomes such when we actually put ourselves in God's hands. It only becomes such when we trade our fight or flight, when we trade our determined or despairing hopelessness, our scurry for survival, for the certainty of God's person, when we place ourselves in God's hands. When we pray with Jesus in the face of threat and uncertainty, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So I want you to see one more example. Sydney and Wanda Knox were pioneer missionaries to Papua New Guinea for the Church of the Nazarene. And after serving for two and a half years in that country, Sydney became debilitatingly sick. She was diagnosed with cancer. Crisis, threat, uncertainty was felt not only by Sydney and his wife Wanda and their small family and by friends and loved ones, but literally by an entire denomination. Nazarenes everywhere rallied in prayer for Sidney Knox and for his healing. And Wanda, facing the uncertainty of becoming a widowed mother of two small children at the age of 27, just knew God would work a miracle of healing for her husband. However, the miracle Wanda envisioned never materialized. And Sidney died exactly three years to the day from when he and Wanda had first landed in Papua New Guinea. Wanda struggled. Why didn't God answer the thousands of prayers that had come before him? Did God hear? Did God care? Was there even a God? Wanda sometimes felt as if she would have to become an agnostic. She declared to God that she had to have some kind of answer, but the struggle continued for several months. And then God came. Wanda describes it this way. I wasn't even thinking about him, she says, when all of a sudden he was there. He didn't give me an answer to why he allowed Sid's death, but he said, I'm here. I'm in control. Trust me. Don't trust me for what I do or for what I don't do. Just trust me. For Wanda, hope was reborn in the certainty of God's person. Not in the wiping away of all of her uncertainty and her, her uh, fears or concerns about the future. That certainty, that certainty for Wanda was a certainty that was found in the person of God. 
Her hope was in God. And that hope became enough for her in both easy and hard times through all the changes and uncertainties she would negotiate in the days ahead as she answered God's call, uh, his bidding, and gave her life to him and his kingdom and returned to Papua New Guinea. Um, in all of that, it would be the very person of God that would be her certainty. And so Wanda would return to Papua New Guinea, knowing God as her comforter, knowing God as her teacher, knowing God as her guide, her helper, her confidence and joy, knowing God was her certainty and singing a song of hope. She would commit herself into God's hands in the midst of all the questions and all the uncertainty because she became certain Wanda anchored her life in the certainty of God's person. The invitation for us today is to do the same. To sing a song of hope like the psalmist. To sing a song of hope in God like our Savior. To sing a song of hope in God like Wanda Knox. Not a song of hope because of a certain set of circumstances. Your circumstances change and fluctuate. Not a, a, a hope because we get the answers desired, sought, or expected. Because things don't always work out the way we think best. But to sing a song of hope in the person of God. Assured in our own spirit that God is gracious and good and capable and kind that God is strong, that God is faithful, that God is enough for us. And even when everything appears impossible, when the old, uh, uh, when the odds and when the indications are stacked against us, when the night is so black we cannot see the way, the invitation is to anchor in Jesus, to anchor ourselves in our Father's hands, to pray, Father, into your hands. You commit our spirit. I want to invite each of us to pray that today. And to pray it as we sing together. And to sing more than he's got the whole world in his hand. A song of God's sovereignty. But to sing, I've anchored myself in God's hand. I've anchored in Jesus. The threat of uncertainty, the storms of life, I'll bring it. I've anchored in Jesus, the very person of God. I fear no wind or wave. I've anchored in Jesus. For he has come and stayed. I've anchored in the one who obeyed the gospel. Brother and sister, I invite us today to sing a song of hope. <laughs> Jesus, I fear the wind away. 
Gracious and almighty God, to know you is to know life of everlasting quality and quantity. Your love is unfailing, and your goodness is abundant. Your strength is our refuge, and your mercy is our salvation. Thank you for making yourself known to us through your Son, Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Grant us so perfectly to know him and to trust in him and with him, that we may steadfastly follow in his steps, as he leads us in hope's path and teaches us hope's song. We pray this through Jesus, our living hope, who lives and reigns with you in unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Let's confess our faith together as we say the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Church Universal, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Receive this benediction. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him. Hasn't it been good to worship together today? The church is not confined or defined by buildings, and our hope is not confined or defined by a set of circumstances. We hope in a living Savior who holds our times in his hands, and we are made one in a love in which there is no separation. Our prayer has been that the Lord would make our online worship service a rich expression of both those truths that each of us would be renewed in hope and in the bond of love that holds us together. If that's been your worship experience today, we give thanks and praise to God. If you would, click like or leave a comment below. It would help us know who was able to worship with us this morning. If you have a prayer request, you can include it as a comment or send a text to Pastor Derek's cell phone, 405-245-1581. We would love to pray with you and for you. If you're a member of our church family and would like to give to the church, 
Mail your check to Piedmont Church of the Nazarene, P.O. Box 126, Piedmont, Oklahoma, 73078. Or you can run cash or check by the church during business hours. Or you can give online by going to our Facebook page, not the Facebook group, but the page, and clicking the Shop Now button or visiting our website, piedmontnazarene.org, and clicking the Give Now button. We are hoping to resume face-to-face -face worship on June 7th. Until then, watch for messages about online church activities, including our Wednesday night Bible study on Daniel. Don't forget, live love, live lean, and live last. Until we meet again next Sunday, grace, grace and, and peace be yours in abundance. I am blessed to have the best mom in the whole world. She is my best friend. I love you, Mom. Mother's Day. I want to give a shout out to all moms who bring their kids to church and emphasize the importance of building your life on the rock, Jesus Christ. It makes a difference. So good job. Keep up the good work. Greetings in the name of our risen Savior. God dang it. Hasn't it good been good? <laughs> Hasn't it been good worshiping today? <laughs> Lord, we are praying for Donna. It, it has been take too 45. long in quarantine, and she is going. <laughs> Help her, Lord. Help her. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.